We are about to begin another episode of the Prosperidin webinar series. From their unique perspective as dentistry's embezzlement experts, Prosperidin's team brings you information you will not find anywhere else. Now sit back and relax while Prosperidin's Amber Weber, Wendy Askins, and David Harris address the issues that are important to you. Well, this is such an exciting um, webinar that we're hosting tonight, um, especially before the holidays. So, you know, I've been in dentistry for over 22 years, and there's been so many things change in those 22 years. But, you know, as dentistry has grown and changed, we all know this really interesting title called the DSO. And so we brought an expert here because, you know, it's so interesting the stuff that you hear now in dentistry about these changes that have started to occur in the last few decades. So we want you, the audience, to have all your questions answered in our special presentation tonight, the good, the bad, and the evil, what you don't know about DSOs. Now tonight it's going to be just like, um, We've always done our length of our webinar is going to be a little over an hour. Now we want you guys to stay tuned because at the end you will get to have special questions answered live with our witness. So be safe for the entire time. But if you can't, as always, we usually record these sessions and you'll be able to see it later on and share all this wonderful information about those DSOs. Um, we, as always, we have continuing education credit that you will be provided with. So please sit back, enjoy this wonderful information that is really approaching all of us in dentistry, and stay tuned so we can answer your, your questions that are just uh, eating at you. Our next yeah. webinar is going to be January the 26th. And it is my extreme honor to be able at that time to introduce you to my friend and former client, Dr. David Hughes. Um, this was a $375,000 theft over a four-year time period. And the employee not only did she use three different theft methodologies is what we always say here on our webinars and when we're talking to our clients and there's a minimum of three theft methodologies but this employee actually targeted the top three financial foundations of david's business it is a fascinating story that will be told by a wonderful man, an excellent cl clinician. So we invite you to join us on January 26th, where you'll get to meet Dr. David Hughes through the webinar. You'll get to hear his story and you'll also get to learn from him. Wendy, I can't wait for that. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. I, I know you lived through this and I, I think, you know, your perspective and, and David's are going to be absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Um, but for right now, um, I want to introduce a, a friend of mine and a, and a very special guest, our, our guest presenter tonight, Emmett Scott. Um, I've known Emmett for, I don't know, six or seven years, probably. We, we first met when we were um, presenting in the same room at the same conference one after the other. So I got to hear his and he got to hear mine. And, and he instantly struck me as a guy that uh, I would I would like to know better. And uh, since then, I've, I've watched him um, really rise to be a, a, a huge force in the DSO world. Uh, Emmett is the CEO of Community Dental Partners, which is a Texas-based, and I think Emmett, you said the other day, 90 offices now are what you support. Yeah, 70, 70, that's right. 70 offices. Okay, I was getting a little ahead of myself. So he, <laughs> first of all, he's, he's the CEO of a, of, of a DSO. Um, but it goes a little bit further. Uh, he's, he's very involved in the DSO community. He's the president of the Association of Dental Support Organizations. Um, he's also very involved with the DSO Secrets podcast and Facebook group. Um, and there are probably some some things I'm missing in terms of your your list of DSO accomplishments, but I really think of Emmett as Mr. DSO. And this is the elephant in the room. I mean, all of our audience know that the DSOs are growing quickly, that they're gobbling up practices. And I think every 
practicing dentist Emmett at some point has to say, you know, is, is, is working with a DSO for me. So at that point, I'll be quiet and let you talk and uh, take it away. Well, thank you so much. And um, if it's okay, I'll, uh, I'll share here. Um, I really appreciate being on, you know, with someone who graduated in accounting uh, in at BYU, I really appreciate uh, get the integrity that you all are bringing to the industry. And I think at the end of the day, you're bringing a lot of support uh, to the industry. So I won't go as far as saying you're a, a DSO, but you're at least bringing a level of support uh, for this industry. Um, I think that for me to share, somebody's gonna have to stop sharing. So not sure uh, that it's saying I, Whoever has got my beautiful picture. Okay, perfect, perfect. So I thought what would be most helpful is walking through this title, Good, Bad, and Evil of DSOs, because I think we make the best decisions when we have the right information. And so if I can be as transparent as possible around what I believe DSOs are philosophically, and even what happens at their entity structure, then with those Lego pieces, people can build out what they want to. And I'll tell you right now, I see at times people will come up with things like a DLO or a DPO or, a, you know, um, they'll try to come up with almost like a new spin on the concept. And, and frankly, I think the word support's a great one. Um, I think some misconceptions have happened, but at the end of the day, what I really want for those listening and watching is to build a great organization for themselves to have the biggest impact. And again, if they understand the details of how the mechanics work, then they can make sure that they do that the right way. As mentioned, um, I do have a, a DSO that I'm partners in, give a little bit of background. My best friend from the age of two is a dentist. And he called me 13 years ago or so and said, I wanna open a practice, I want some help. I wanna automate as many of the back office type procedures as possible. We built this beautiful practice. He really wanted to serve kids. It was built as a storybook. Kids are called back as prince or princess. They get gold coins along the way. At the end, they get crowned for their bravery and dentistry. They get a balloon, they get a sticker. Mom gets a sticker. They get to spend their money. You know, we ask them, do you have any money? They have their gold coins. And really what we're trying to do is connect oral health care to something that's fun. Because as we all know, getting a root canal is not fun, you know? So if we can start to correlate those things at a young age and that first three weeks, we had a thousand first visit patients come in, which anyone in this industry knows that's a lot. And so we said, well, we should probably build another one of these. We didn't know what a DSO was, um, but I was just helping my buddy out. And so at the, at the lowest level of definition, maybe that's what I think a DSO is, is helping your buddy out. And we ended up having more practices. And then I started hearing about this thing called DSO. And I said to Chad, I said, are we doing something evil? You know, I'm hearing about these DSOs. Are we doing something evil? I think we're trying to have impact. I think I'm trying to help you, but is there something uh, going on here? I started the podcast DSO Secrets to kind of start sharing what we were doing and to hear feedback and to try to, um, you know, net out what's really going on. And what I found, I'm excited to share with you uh, around these entrepreneurs and the impact they were having. Um, I ended up partnering with the Dentist Entrepreneur Organization, which really helps dentists, whether it's one practice or 50 practice, to be a better entrepreneur and a better executive. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, right as COVID was hitting, July of, of 2020, um, the organization asked me to be president of ADSO. So at this point, I have seen small practices, big practices, multi-billion dollar groups, et cetera. And I say all of that, not for bragging rights, but to say, I've had my finger in a lot of pies. I, I'd also say, don't help your buddy out. You'll really end up in his industry. But I have my finger in a lot of pies and I've been able to see how this is done at all different levels. And so that's what I really hope to share with all of you today. So you have those pieces. So here's a couple of things we're gonna hit. I'm gonna share what I believe is the true origin story of DSOs, how to identify some of the good, bad and evil. I'm gonna make that really simple for you to kind of take home and be able to use. And then key principles, if you're like, hey, I wanna build a DSO, but I wanna do it the right way. And what I believe is kind of right way principles, and then you know where to start in, in building your own. Or maybe just choosing, maybe some of you are thinking about partnering with one, et cetera. How would you net some of those things out? 
So I think we've got to start with what most people believe uh, is how DSO started. And that is private equity firms had a bunch of money. They really liked dentistry and they decided that they were going to take over it. They were going to make dentist puppets and control them uh, with these large sums of money. And those with the gold make the rules. And so they started buying dentists up and you know they're evil basically and they're controlling clinical care and all of these things the problem i have with that story is it requires a couple of big assumptions that i just don't buy into um, and i now have enough da data point to know that this is true number one is you have to believe that dentists are really stupid um, lack all integrity and you know don't learn from their mistakes kind of thing and that they're kind of willing to just do whatever for uh, a quick uh, hit of dollars. And then they're willing to be puppets to other people. I, the dentists I've met uh, are not that way. They're very thoughtful. They're very detail oriented. They look over things. It's not that they're a master on every contract and so forth, but you're not going to have a thousand dentists working in a DSO organization and all of them be idiots. Okay. So that assumption just, it doesn't play out. Capitalism's too strong. Number two, in like 48 states, um, only dentists can actually own the practice. So if you believe the gold makes the rules, the one who is controlling all the revenue that is coming in is the dentist, right? Because the insurance companies, all the payments are running through those practices and those have to be owned by clinicians. And so, um, you know, you can say, oh, well, they contracted in this way. No, at the end of the day, the dentists are in control and are, and are in power. And so if you start to, one thing I'd say is if you believe that dentists are being controlled, I call those dental control organizations, DCOs. And we can talk a little bit about where that could happen, um, but those should be wiped off the face of the earth. And I'll tell you how to do that. But I think it's already happened because anytime a non-dentist has decided to try to control a dentist, they can pull a couple levers. One is they quit. You know, there is no like servitude where they have to stay at an organization. I don't care what a contract is, you just stop working, you know? And so anyone who's tried that methodology, those DSOs, DCOs just like went away and they blew up and they're gone. Or the dentist takes the practice back. He just says, hey, I'm breaking this contract with the DSO and I'm taking the practice back. And I've seen that happen as well. So I don't believe that these uh, really exist to the extent people think. And so, you know, I think understanding what a true DSO is. Here's what I think has really happened. And I have the data here to prove it is that entrepreneur dentists, like my friend, Dr. Chad Evans, wanted to have more impact as they were having success. They wanted to serve more patients. They wanted to open in a second location. They wanted to create passive income for themselves because they didn't see themselves at the chair their whole life. They saw themselves as maybe mentoring other dentists. And anytime you start to have more people, as everyone knows here, it gets kind of crazy. Like you need more help, right? You need help around IT, you need help around HR, you need help around compliance, you need help around finance, all of these things. And so you start bringing in people who are experts in that. And as Chad will say, while I was going through years and years of dental school, some poor guy was studying accounting, you know, and somebody else was studying marketing and so forth. So if I really want to have impact on a community, why wouldn't I take those best people, surround myself with them, and then start building out an organization simply to support me as the clinician? And I think the name dental support organization really um, hits on what you're trying to achieve there. Now, where does private equity come in? Anyone who's borrowed money from, let's call our traditional Bank of America, Wells Fargo, et cetera, knows that at least in the early years, uh, they were very open to like, hey, you just got out of school and you wanna open a practice, no problem, here's some money, let's get going. Which is kind of crazy to me, but uh, it was working just fine. When Dentists got to their second or third practice, though, something would shift for them because it went from kind of owner finance banking into corporate banking. In other words, instead of them underwriting and saying, hey, can this dentist like pay back this loan just by his income? He's working as a dentist. 
or does he actually have to have an organization that can support this loan we're giving them? It changed where it went in the bank and corporate banking said, yeah, there's no way we're giving this dentist a loan to open up four, five, six, 10 locations. And so private equity said, well, we'll give you the money. Mesdet said, we'll give you the money. So there was non-banking solutions these dentists tried to started using, trying to solve their bigger vision, which was to have more impact. And that is the only way private equity gets into the space because dentists control um, every part of this process. I so, guess I mean, if, if I can jump in for a second, what, I, what hadn't occurred to me till you said this is if I'm a dentist and I'm trying to choose between two DSOs, and one is sort of very financially oriented and, and doesn't seem to respect me as a clinician. And the other one says, you come here and be a clinician and we'll just take all these other burdens off your shoulders. I know where I'm going. And, and you, you just made that very clear. What's, and you see it right now because as dentists have gotten better at opening practices and they've gotten DSO support. And so we'll say as there's bigger and bigger and more DSOs, guess who the customer of a DSO is? The dentist, right? The patient is actually the customer of our customer. The reason we do marketing, the reason we bring in the patient is because our customer, the dentist wants to have more patients, right? So at the end of the day, if you're judging between different DSOs, it's actually really easy. You just be as selfish as possible. <laughs> you know, you just say, who is going to provide me the best type of support? Now, that support might look like, hey, I really want to learn how to do implants. Hey, I really want to be an underserved community. Hey, I really want to be in this small town, but I want to be able to make a lot of money and I don't want to have to deal with X, Y, and Z. So as you design kind of your life goals, you're actually designing what kind of support, what kind of DSO you want to be a part of. And you can start using that really as kind of the resume checkoff box of what you're looking for. Now, here's something I'd say for those practice owners who have one associate, you're a DSO, okay? Now you might not have the LLC structure you might not, but I can promise you if I went to your associate and said, hey, did you join with Dr. So-and-so because you were really excited about doing payroll on Friday? They would say, no, 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 I, I was expecting him to do. It. Oh, you joined because you wanted to figure out where the router needed to go and work with the IT guy. No, 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 I was hoping he would take care of that or she would take care of that. Um, oh, you wanted to do HR and you wanted to hire people and deal with the front desk issues. No, I was hoping, you know. So every associate really is thinking about the practice they're in as a dental support organization. They're gonna provide me some clinical mentoring, but they're going to take all of the back office business stuff off of me. Otherwise, if I had to manage all of that, why wouldn't I just own my own practice, right? So again, I think the reason that is so important is because if you're hiring an associate today and you're not thinking about, uh, about them as being a DSO yourself, you're probably not providing them the support they're thinking about that the relationship should have. Now you might also say, yeah, but that associate's hoping to have equity someday. And so it's different. No, there's DSOs now where the associate can have equity, can grow into equity, can have equity at the DSO level, can have it at the practice level. So again, good old capitalism, as it starts saying, what does my customer want, starts designing this. And I'll tell you at the end of the day, the dentists are winning. They're getting the big sign-on bonuses. They're getting the compensation. And frankly, they're doing less than they would have if they were just a business owner by themselves. They're getting equity positions and everything else. Um, so, you know, as you look at a single dentist wanting to support more patients and then bringing together the different parts and services that start to come from that at, at the grassroots, that is what a DSO is all under one umbrella. So yeah, as I said, the truth is you become a DSO, at least philosophically, you should be if you're planning on holding on to that associate. Occasionally, and I'm, I'm sure David, you see this too, where a dentist says, man, you just can't find a good associate this day, th these days, you know, I would say, yeah, you're just not a good DSO. <laughs> Your associate chose not to work with you anymore, or you're not sure how to mentor them, or you're not sure how to build and grow them. L let's be honest, bringing an associate right out of school, or even one that has other habits, skill sets, modalities, 
is not easy work to just integrate them in. And this is where DSOs have gotten very good, frankly. Again, I don't think thousands of dentists have been duped. I think that they are following where the biggest opportunities are for them in their personal development. So this is what DSOs actually do really well. They are increasing the autonomy of the associate. Now, I can tell you, um, David, you probably haven't heard that before. It's like, I'm going to go work for a DSO because I want more autonomy. But at a very psychological level, let me ask you this. And as a patient, if you knew a dentist was working on you, thinking about IT marketing strategies and the fight that's happening in the front desk, do they have full autonomy or are they thinking about a lot of other things that I actually wish they were just focused on the clinical procedure they're doing? And my argument would be that in the best case DSO scenario, that dentist is walking in and all they need to focus on is the patient. They're actually expecting the DSO to do the marketing, to do all the HR issues, to do the IT, to make sure the equipment's working. And I'm not saying that they all do it perfectly, et cetera. I'm just saying it's better than you having to worry about that all the time yourself. I, I never pick a dentist because they're a good business person. You know, the, the, the dentist I choose to go to clinically is great. And that's why I go there. Um, you know, it's, it's just not a factor in my choice. So I, I guess, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, we can, want great dentists because they're great dentists. Can, yeah. can we tackle the elephant in the room? Because, you know, I think a lot of uh, what a lot of dentists perceive about a, a DSO is that, you know, it's more or less the antichrist and they're going to sell their soul to the devil and whatever other religious incarnations I can come up with. And they're going to, you know, they're going to lose their clinical autonomy and there's going to be a non-clinician office manager somewhere telling them how to practice. I mean, that's, I think, the fear that that every dentist has about, about throwing their hat in the DSO ring. And, and um, I, I, I know you see that a little bit differently. Well, I, again, what I don't like about that is the assumption has to be that the clinician has no backbone and no free agency to make life choices. You know, I haven't found a scenario where a dentist is, you know, padlocked to the chair, unable to leave. And I've heard people say, well, some of these contracts or some, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, if something feels unethical to you, then you leave. Now, here's what I have seen, David, and I think this is important to call out is sometimes there are bad associate dentists. They're just not good. Um, and they're, when I say they're not good, it's not just that their clinical skills aren't good. They're not good at taking feedback from a mentor. So let me ask you if an associate dentist is getting feedback from another clinician and they're not accepting it, you know, surprise, surprise, they're a little prideful and so forth. Do they tend to go to their buddies and say, you know what, I'm, I'm just not a humble person. I don't take feedback well. I had several patients come in and complain. Um, they tried to mentor me, but I gave them the stiff arm um, because, you know, I'm a jerk, frankly. Or do they say the DSO was trying to control me? Like, which is the easier way to say this? Now, I would say from the, the research I've done and, and looking at different organizations, where we do have to be careful is actually doctor owners. Doctor owners feel very comfortable going into a clinician. And I'm not sure that they shouldn't, by the way, but they feel fine going into a clinician and saying, hey, your work is crappy. <laughs> like I, we need to upgrade you. I need to get you CEs, you need to do better, or you are way too slow on these patients. You know, I know, especially with children, like they have timers, like there's only so much time we've got here. You can't take two hours. This isn't, you know, dental school. What some dentists will then say is, oh, the DSO is trying to control me. Now, what's weird about that is, no, you've got a dentist mentoring you, but does that dentist own the DSO? Yes. So are we playing with semantics a little bit here? Yeah, we're playing with semantics. So I've seen that. And, you know, I would love if others have um, different scenarios that they personally had that they could point to. But again, most of them would have to assume that the clinician, you know, just has no backbone or no ability to make their own choice. And I would say there's enough choices out there that anyone that's, you know, any DSO or any, frankly, practice 
that's doing a bad job taking care of the doctors, making them hit quotas and some of that stuff that I hear that their dentists just leave. I mean, I saw a dentist who built out seven locations, had 20 dentists in them. And in one month, that dentist lost 14 dentists. Okay. They all left. Why? Because he was a jerk and they hated working for him. And, you know, he, they didn't like how he talked to staff and, and so forth. And they all left. So I think those, you know, dentist owners either have to kind of change their tune to be better business owners or they end up going out of business. The free market is an ultimate great leveler, isn't it? It, it it's very powerful. It's very powerful. Um, I, I want to go a little bit into entity structure because I think this is helpful. When you think about a single practice, you've got the revenue coming into, and I have a PLLC, it could be a PA, whatever. It's a practice owned by a clinician. Now I'm, I'm getting out of kind of the philosophy of a DSO into kind of legal structure that most people would think of as a DSO. When you have this DSO structure, you've brought in these non-dentist partners and you've put them in a separate LLC. And you wanna be able to give them equity in that LLC because he, here's the problem, as you start to expand and you wanna bring in really talented marketing people, they also could like go work at Amazon or Facebook or you know other places. And so they're gonna want some equity in an entity, but they can't have equity in a PLLC. Only you as the dentist can control that and own it. So by setting up the separate LLC, you're able to give them equity in that. Now that LLC by itself has no real value. So what you do is you set up a management contract between the LLC and the practice. And to the extent that the DSO LLC is bringing value to the practice, you're able to move dollars up to that LLC and now it has value. So the money runs from you know insurance or, the, or whatever payer to the PLLC. And then as management services are provided, it moves up to the LLC. So as I was talking about the person with the gold makes the rules here, you can see that all of that revenue is coming through the dentist who is deciding, yes, I'm getting support and I'm moving that money or that net income up to the LLC for the management services provided. Now, in, in almost every scenario, the dentist who owns the practice is also gonna have equity in the LLC. If they're the founding dentist, they're gonna have the majority of the equity in the LLC. But something magical happens because free market system, if I own a practice and I wanna sell it to another dentist, that's fine. And we've done that for years and years, but that dentist can only get so much money and you're really kind of selling them your job. You know, It's just a single practice and so forth. If I've set up multiple practices, if I'm mentoring dentists, if I've built out a team, well, now I've got an organization that's having much bigger impact. I've got passive income. And if I'm moving that passive income into an LLC structure, now we start talking about multiples of EBITDA. We start talking about a value that is much greater. And so this is what got it interesting for entrepreneur dentists is because something's magical happens when you actually build out an organization right? The dentists are able to manage the clinical side and allow the rest to run smoothly without their oversight. And owners are able to get more equity value because they've moved the economics to the LLC. So if I was using kind of round numbers, I know most dentists would say I sold my practice um, for 60, 70, 80% of revenue, hundred percent of revenue. If you think of it as more net income, we use EBITDA. They really sold it for, let's say two, three, four times EBITDA. And now with this structure, as you grow, you might be at eight, 10, 12 times of EBITDA. So imagine your practices all of a sudden being worth six times, right? And why is that? Because you built an organization that's having impact on the community. You're not just an individual dentist, almost like a franchise who has a job and you're selling your job to somebody else. And this has really started entrepreneur dentists to start thinking about this. Wait, if I could build out a support structure my life got easier. I got out of the chair. I could jump into the chair if I wanted to, but I had this whole back office system and my whole organization was worth 600, you know, 600% more, six times more. Yeah. Let me figure that out. Right. And so when you say, man, DSOs are growing. Yeah. Because dentists are really smart. See, that's the difference between, I think the two 
um, philosophies is, do we believe dentists are dumb and they're all getting duped? Or do we think they're really smart and they're following the economics and the impact that they could have on the community? And I believe, and I have seen the dentists are really smart and what they're doing is really powerful and it's allowing other dentists and it's allowing patients to get served. It's allowing other dentists to grow and develop and it's allowing patients to get served in ways that they never would have otherwise. Because the other thing you get when you start building out these economics is you can start making investments into technology that you simply couldn't do as a single practice. You can go into communities that you couldn't do as a single practice. You can service Medicaid patients in a way you couldn't as a single practice. Like the, the expansion of care has grown because of the DSO market. The innovation has grown because of this DSO philosophy. Well, not just even that. You know, I, I, I go back, Emmett, maybe 25 years. And 25 years ago, it was very difficult to find a good associate position. Um, you know, there, were, there was just a real lack of opportunity for people graduating from dental school. And, uh, you know, they ended up in sort of second tier positions. You know, they, they got roped into buying because some, you know, the, it, was a, it was a seller's market as far as associateships go. And, the, you know, the doctors who own practices said, the only way I'm going to talk to you is if you agree to buy my practice in three years. And uh, one thing that I've noticed that the DSO world has done is that now, you know, you graduate from dental school, you have a lot of different opportunities. I saw bonuses, you know, 20,000, 50,000. Hey, you know, we have a program at Community Dental Partners where we help pay off the student loans. Like the innovation, in order yeah. to get that before, you usually need to go work, you know, um, and, you know, for $80,000 and some reservation or some other kind of uh, component, DSOs are now innovating past that where, you know, with our organization, you could make 400,000 and you get student loan payoffs. So things like that uh, are possible because you're getting division of labor, you're getting great patient access, you're getting all this technology and you got clinicians now getting a lot of CE very quickly. So, well, what's the hardest part of running a DSO? You know, I had a entrepreneur friend who said, Emmett, if we could get rid of the customers and employees, business would be really easy. Um, and the hardest part is always people, right? And so when I talk to dentists who aren't scaling and growing, a lot of it, frankly, is just, man, this people is, is really complex. And I can tell you that DSOs are not immune to this. Figuring out how to lead and develop people is still the hardest part. So if, if a DSO is failing, it could be that there's some evil leader out there, or it could be that they're simply trying to figure out how to be better leaders among people. And that's something I think we all should be supportive of and figure out, you know, how to develop these out um, more and more. So I, I mentioned that I was going to help you identify whether a DSO is good, bad, or evil. And I think I've given you the baseline here, dental support organization. So good. I talked to a DSO and it says, Emmett, here's how we're going to support you as a clinician. And I look at that and I go, that's a long list. I like it. And I've got the CE credits and we've got this team, et cetera. Now, the reason why the origin story is so important is if you're going into it with confidence and saying, I am going to demand support, you're going to end up with a better DSO. If you go into it saying, I've got to protect my autonomy and I think these guys are evil. Every time they say, we're going to do marketing. Well, I've, I've got to do the marketing. Well, we're going to help you with that. I got to control the IT. You know, you're just going to have the wrong mindset around this. But if you're like, no, 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 I'm my own person. I, I can identify. Yes, I want that support because I want greater autonomy to develop in my clinical skills. That's really how you identify the best DSOs. They've created standardization around certain things. Um, they're focused. The ideal DSO is really focused on the patient type they want to serve. I'm very concerned around DSOs who are trying to be everything to all people, because I don't know if I've got patients doing pediatric all the way to geriatric, am I really going to be able to support around that? You know, there's a reason why a restaurant specializes on a certain set of food, et cetera. And when we talk about dentistry, we do a little bit of a disservice because the reality is, there's all these different patient types. 
that are very different and need different procedures, modalities, technologies, uh, care, support. And frankly, the assistants need different training if they're doing dentures or they're sedating children. You know, So all of those things, I think you wanna look for a DSO who knows who they are and how they're supporting the marketplace. I think as the list starts getting shorter and you start hearing things like, um, yeah, we're not, you know, yeah, we don't do that. You get to do that. This used to be something that I think people were kind of excited about. Um, but what I'm hearing more and more is dentists are realizing that it's actually li limiting their clinical autonomy because they're having to, to manage more. Th they're also not getting the CE credits and the support that they were looking for. I think you want to be careful if you find that there's a lot of arrogance amongst the clinical leadership. I wouldn't worry as much if there's arrogance around, you know, the CFO or the, you know, the marketing, et cetera, though I, I look for good culture within any company, but who's that clinical director who's really driving this? And that kind of leads me to what I think is somewhat evil. And that is when they say, you know what, you can just do whatever you want. And the reason I'm most concerned about this is because it's shorthand for we're not providing you any support at all. And the only reason I call it evil is because it feels deceptive. And that's what I think is evil. Um, I think if someone just came out and said, hey, what we're doing is really trying to roll up some practices together and hoping we can trick the private equity firms into giving us a high multiple, but we're really not giving you any additional support or help, I think that would be a little more honest. So when I see kind of that roll up and sometimes it's dentists, frankly, who are just here, we're just gonna buy a bunch of practices and everybody gets their own autonomy to do whatever you want. It's fine, but that's just like a group of practices with a bunch of autonomy doing whatever they want. That's not a dental support organization. I don't hear a marketing strategy for how we're gonna expand uh, patient care. I don't hear a mentoring strategy for how we're gonna take care of clinicians. I don't hear standardization around technology to make sure that that's going to be. I don't hear um, you know, a cultural mantra that says, here's how we're going to have people behave and work well together. The other extreme, of course, is, hey, there's only one way to do things around here. And if you don't do them, then, you know, you're out. I think that one's easier to identify. Um, and I think people are more sensitive to that. This do whatever you want, I think that's tricky. And I don't think people have identified that as a non-DSO. But I think as time plays out, I'm hearing more and more dentists go, man, I kind of joined for like support and I'm not getting any. So as you think about building your DSO, I'm gonna give you really simple principles here, but a lot of dentists miss this and then they have to go back and, and figure it out. You, you picked up on one that I'm very passionate about. You need to establish what kind of patients you wanna serve and what kind of procedures you believe are acceptable for serving those patients. You actually want to design a box that you're gonna train your clinicians into. And I'm talking about the clinical directors. I'm not talking about the CFO and the marketing team. I'm talking you as the dentist owners, who do you want to serve? And one of the things I do hear from dentists is I'll say, hey, what kind of patients are you taking care of? And they say, oh, we're bread and butter dentistry. Okay, that's not the patient type. That's not the avatar that you're really focused on. I think when you start saying, we're helping women between these age groups on these procedure types who feel insecure about these things, who have you know kids at home who want to do this. Who... Now you start to kind of narrow in now, this is called niching um, from a business perspective and everyone gets nervous about that because then they say, well, now Frank's not gonna come in. No, Frank will come in, but you've got to get very clear on who you wanna serve, design your practice around that, design your staff around that. All of us can feel when a business has really set itself up to take care of us well. And guess what? You buy the right technology because you know what procedures you're gonna do. You train your staff better because you know what kind of patients and procedures you're going to do. So that would be principle number one for building a great DSO. And I know it's tough to really get focused like that, um, but that's, that's the critical. Then start thinking about, okay, when I hire these associates, what support am I telling them that we're going to provide? Make a list of those. And, and think about the simple stuff like, yeah, you won't have to fix a computer, <laughs> you know, um, and you're not gonna have to deal with this and so forth. That's really, again, it's a dental support organization. So think about those components. And then start thinking about 
where do I want to go from here in providing and building out that organization? Now at DEO, at the Dentist Entrepreneur Organization, we have the DEO map. And we say you grow from a practice to a business to an organization, right? And what you're looking for is, okay, I want more time or I want to have more impact or I just want more profitability or passive income. Now, why is there this big slinky here? Because really what I see as growth is I get my marketing set up, I get my accounting set up, I get my compliance right, you know, revenue cycle management, et cetera. HR. And then I come around and I go, man, I really need to upgrade my marketing again. And then I got to get my accounting a little bit better. And then I got to get my compliance even better. And as you grow, you're just going to constantly be upgrading along the way, kind of moving up this slinky here. Um, where should you start? Now, people always ask me, Emmett, how should I, who should I hire first? Th that's probably the number one question. Who should I hire first? And my little trick that I've used as, as an entrepreneur and business owner is follow your anxieties. Now, the reason this works is because you're the most valuable leader in your organization. And to the extent that you hire individuals to solve for your anxieties, you free yourself up to be a better leader, to design out the vision and to make the right next decision. So if I have anxiety that people are stealing from me, <laughs> I need to solve that, right? If I have concerns around my accounting controls, I need to solve that because opening seven no new locations is not going to solve for the fact that I have bad accounting controls, right? Or if my marketing I'm concerned about, I need to solve for that first. And then from there, I'll just follow my next anxiety. Now, if you don't love that, we do have something a little more sophisticated at DEO. It's called the DEO map, as I mentioned. It's actually a dental operating system for teams and it helps them, dentists like specifics. They like checklists, they like to follow, you know, and so do teams, frankly. So this gives the 10 foundational elements to building out your dental organization. It's got a curriculum that teaches each of the different teams or departments on really how to thrive. And you get a scoreboard early on so you can measure your progress along the way and just continue to, to move up. So here's another tool that we can give everyone. Ultimately, David, what I want to see is dentists, entrepreneur dentists, continue to have the right resources to have the impact on the community. In America, the largest childhood disease is still oral health care disease. Right? So we have so much opportunity. I've heard dentists be concerned early on about DSOs, and I have two things that they should know. Number one, no patient knows what a DSO is. And that's where capitalism starts, is the patient coming in. What the patient knows is how they felt. So if, you, if you're building a DSO, don't get overly sophisticated. Establish first that you have this amazing experience for the patient. And if you're a single practice and you don't want anything to do, with opening new locations or hiring associates, you're gonna be just fine if you just take care of patients. So I, that I would say um, you know, is, is critical. If anyone has any questions you know, around DEO, I thought I'd put this up, got the QR code. Darren's great to talk you know, just as a, as a throwaway here. Um, but with that, I'll open it up to any questions around DSOs, David, that you or others might have or other things that, that you've heard. Curious your thoughts as I've walked through this, you know, if another dentist was sitting here, what they might push back on. Yeah, well, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I said before. I think to a lot of dentists, this amounts to selling their soul to the devil. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted people to have another perspective. And, and again, Emmett, you've been a, a, a tremendous spokesman for um, the other side of the story here. And I, I guess what I'd say to the audience is it's kind of like restaurants. I mean, there was a time when there was no such thing as a chain restaurant and every restaurant was individually owned and operated. And each owner of a restaurant had to deal with a whole bunch of problems. And then chain restaurants came along and they took people and, 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 and they, they helped them deal with some of their problems so they could focus on other ones. Um, to me, there's a place for both, you know, and if you're going out for dinner tonight, you can decide, do I want to go to a chain? Do I want to go to, um, you know, a, a, a non-affiliated restaurant? The fact that chain restaurants came along didn't, didn't wipe the others out. There's, there's a place for both. 
And I guess what I'd say in dentistry is probably there are a place for dentists who want to own a practice and have no entrepreneurial ambitions beyond that. And there's also a place for dentists who want to plug into something bigger. Yeah, I think that's well assessed. And again, kind of coming back, the patients don't know. And I think your restaurant analogy is a great one. Um, you know, for me, at the end of the day, when I go out, I want to have good food and good service, <laughs> you know, and if the if the chain has established itself as doing that, then I'm going there. And if they haven't, then they go away. So. That's right. I mean, you're, you're, you're what you're ultimately giving with restaurants or DSOs is you're, you're giving patients or, or customers choices. And uh, you also pointed out something else that I don't want the audience to miss. Uh, a lot of DSOs will be able to go in and deal with otherwise unserviced components of the population. I mean, I, I know DSOs, for example, Emmett, who only deal with Medicaid patients. Yep. And I don't think as a private practitioner, you could do that and survive. Yeah, we have a lot of practices we support who do Medicaid. And I can tell you that the amount of compliance support that it requires for those dentists to feel safe about mm -hmm. servicing that population is intense. I mean, billers don't make billing mistakes when you're on Medicaid, they do fraud, waste and abuse with the state or government, right? And so how critical it is to have those audited, those patients, frankly, would not get the services from dentists. Because if I was a dentist, that's too scary. My license is at risk. If I don't have a massive organization supporting that and ensuring that, and I can see it, then I'm probably, you know, I'll just go over here and do implants and have a good life. Um, so those patients are absolutely getting service because DSOs are willing to do the heavy regulatory lift for doctors. Yeah. Absolutely. We had uh, Dr. Roy Shelburne as a guest a little while ago. And uh, I, I, I suspect, Emmett, you know who, who Roy is, but he, he was a solo practitioner and he got in trouble over dealing with Medicaid patients and documentation and things like that. And um, yeah, you know, you, if, if you ask Roy, you know, with the benefit of hindsight in the two years you spend in prison, um, would you like to have had more support in that area? I, I don't think he would have said no. It's tricky too, because PPO insurance requirements are not that intense. And right. as soon as you take that first Medicaid patient, you're dancing with the devil. It's a totally different level. So it's interesting you bring this up, David, because when I've looked at DSOs, the ones that are supporting Medicaid practices are some of the best. And that's kind of out of necessity. Those who are servicing PPO can kind of drop down on some of their compliance requirements. And frankly, fee for service, you know, some of them don't even use practice management software. <laughs> they do, they're not billing anybody. It's just, you know, cash pay, right? Or it's it's credit card pay. So uh, when you think about going into these different organizations, looking at that support piece and what's going to be there, or if you're thinking about taking care of different patient types, if you're going to step over into Medicaid, you're going to need to build a much more robust DSO than if you're doing fee for service. Yeah. Okay. I have a few questions um, from our question and answer uh, button. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to rapid fire like two of them, and and it's kind of comments from the very beginning of um, your message. Um, so Sean asks, if the dentist is truly the customer of the DSO, why sell the practice? It seems counterintuitive. That's number one. And then the other one is, can you go back and make the correlation between um, a DSO and an owner dentist versus an owner dentist and an associate dentist. Sure. Okay. Let me take those on. So the first question was, why would a dentist ever sell? Well, it says, um, it says, if the dentist is truly the customer of the DSO, why sell the practice? Yeah, I, I, I'm, and sorry, I mean, let me give a little background because I, I, I know the questioner. He's a, he's a good friend of mine. He's Sean Pierce. He's a, he's a lawyer so, uh, and, and, and a practice management consultant. So um, frame it in those terms. And I think what he's struggling to reconcile is kind of the, just, the, the 
the doctor selling to the DSO and then the doctor becoming the DSO's customer. Okay, great. Well, so it's really interesting. So now that I know this is an attorney, I'll, I'll maybe get a little more specific. When we say the dentist sold to the DSO, it, that's technically not true. Okay, except in like a couple of states where like a PLC can actually be owned by non-dentists. What really happens is what's called an asset purchase agreement. And so the LLC will buy assets of the, of the practice, but what they're really buying is the opportunity to have the practice as the customer and to provide them support. What's, what's really fascinating about this whole thing is the DSO is able to connect itself to the practice and generate profit only to the extent that they actually take care of the practice, keep associates there, bring patients in the door, et cetera. I mean, it's truly like capitalism at, at its heart. There has to be real value there. So the DSO is paying for the practice at a certain multiple. And then by providing these services, that multiple increases dramatically for the other LLC, and that is called arbitrage. So I'm buying something for four times, the dentist is thrilled. I might even have the dentist, if they want to, roll into the DSO, at which point now that's worth 12 times because I've got this organizational structure and the support and so forth that allows private equity to help invest. That's in between someone who understands the technical got that, someone who doesn't, you know, maybe we need to draw some pictures there, but that's kind of the magic that happens. The dentist is not an idiot. <laughs> They're like, I can sell to a, another dentist, hope that, you know, one, they can't pay as much, but number two, hope that they can like take care of these patients. I have to mentor them, et cetera. They get the money. And then how do I like get out and retire versus a DSO who says, hey, we've got a whole system for your retirement. I've got associates and I'm going to get them trained up and you're going to get five times the value you were going to get selling to another dentist directly. That's where dentists are brilliant and they're going, yeah, I like this DSO thing. And then DSOs are competing. Oh, well, they're offering you that. Well, we'll provide you better support and we'll allow you to leave in two years instead of three years. And like the dentists are winning on this, you know, and everybody's got to figure out um, just how to, you know, take care of dentists even more. So that's, that I think is a pretty good answer on that first one. Okay. Um, the second one was. Um, the second one was um, making the correlation between. Got it. Yes. I remember now. Or an owner dentist and an associate. Yeah. So I think when people think about a DSO, they think about a bunch of locations. They think about maybe LLC structure. They think of Heartland and Aspen and PDS and the multi-billion dollar groups, right? And so they go, wait, what's that got to do with me and my associate? And my argument is philosophically, let's not think about entity structure. At a philosophical level, those associates that work with all those big groups and your associate that works with you have the exact same expectation. And the expectation is they're gonna show up, someone's gonna take care of billing, someone's gonna take care of HR, someone's gonna take care of IT, and they're gonna be a clinician. And if you're having a hard time hiring associates because they're going to work for another DSO or because they're going to work for a DSO, it's because they're providing better support than you're providing. So it's smart to start thinking about yourself as like, Okay, if I want to hire an associate, what am I offering them other than like a job, you know, and by doing that, by using the DSO mindset, by even doing the interview and saying, hey, are you willing to learn these procedures? I'm going to, I'll be willing to provide you these CEs. Hey, just so you know, we do the marketing for your patients here. You know, by starting to think that way, you're going to get better associates and you're going to have more options to choose from. Okay, I have a question from um, one of our uh, audience members. If the DSO model continues to grow over the next five or 10 years, do you foresee the associate fees paid to dentists, say 40% of collections less lab fees, declining or stabilizing to a more fixed fee structure similar to other professional services such as lawyers, engineers, et cetera? Good, good question. Right now, I, I can tell you right now, the DSO model is benefiting dentist fee structure. 
because if they're truly our customer, if let me, here's another point that I don't think I, I called out when people are scared about DSOs. And I, I mentioned one point, which was the patient doesn't actually know what a DSO is. So don't be too scared, you know, just like open your practice and do great care. Patient won't know. Number two, 50% of Americans don't go to the dentist. Okay. In, in other industries, they call that penetration rate. Like what is our penetration rate? I think we're actually at 40%, but I'm giving us a little bit of credit. So well, let's say at 50%. That means that if we got everyone in America to go to the dentist, we would double the entire industry. You know, the problem with that, we don't have enough dentists. <laughs> we, we definitely yeah. don't have enough hygienists, right? And we don't have enough staff. Mm -hmm. What's happening with DSOs is they're getting better at, at a part that dentists were terrible at, and that is marketing. And they're getting better at building out practices that are beautiful. And they're getting better at getting the right billboards and doing the right social media and all of those pieces. And I'm not saying individual dentists aren't doing that, but on scale, DSOs are doing that. And guess what they're getting access to? A bunch of patients. What's their biggest problem now? They need dentists to service yeah. those patients, <laughs> right? People. Exactly. People. They need hygienists. They need, right? So what they're trying to figure out is, well, could I pay them more money? Could I provide them more support? Like, what do I need right now? What, what do I need to do to attract these dentists? And dentists are starting to make choices. Like, well, I only want to live in these cities and I only want to work this many days. And can you do this? Can you make it a shift work? Like DSOs are having to figure out for dentists that are showing up and saying, I'm willing to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You know, I'm a mom, I've got kids and Tuesday, Thursdays, I need off. DSOs are like, okay, so can I find the other person who only wants to work Tuesday, Thursdays, right? So those yeah. kind of things are benefiting dentists. I think at the end of the day, dentists are going to win in compensation and free time. And the best dentists, right? If all of us just focus on the best dentists are really going to win because DSOs are going to need them to mentor, to lead, to train. They're going to give them equity. You know, again, these are clinical owners of these practices that need smart people like them to help expand and grow. Yeah, it really is a dentist market right now. Yeah. Um, you know, and what I see happening in the marketplace is a lot of consolidation right now. In other words, you know, the guy who owns 20 practices is being bought by the entity that owns 100. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that. You know, there was a time when most of the transactions were probably individual dental owners affiliating with a DSO. Now, you know, you've, you've got groups and you've got bigger, you know, bigger fish swallowing the minnows kind of. Well, what's happening too is those DSOs at 20 locations, life got really complex with COVID and everything else. They need now a bigger staff to help them. Recruiting is mm -hmm. harder than it's ever been. Maybe at 20 locations, you don't have dedicated recruiting team. You were just kind of doing that part on your own. So again, there's kind of layers to DSOs and those two are better and bigger and got better experts on certain things, better taking care of, of docs. You know, they're kind of saying, hey, do you want me to help you small DSO? You know, and there's some um, great financial benefit to those dentist owners. I have a comment and then a question. Um, I absolutely loved the evil slide <laughs> because I, I know, especially um, in the work that, that we do, having gone through thousands of dental databases, looking at transactions, I loved the point that you made where you're basically saying, don't be better at opening a practice than you are at running it. Mm -hmm. Because I, I hear doctors talk about that a lot. It's like a dream to have, you know, a multi-location practice and they're so excited and they, they judiciously open the practice. And then once patients start coming in, it's like the wheels fall off because mm -hmm. they don't have the support to run that particular practice correctly. Okay. So that's my one comment. Um, my that. question is good, and, and I, I this is an excellent question. Okay, the last major economic recession in North America was around seven, eight, and nine. How do you see the impact of an upcoming recession affecting the overall dental industry based on your prior experience due to previous downturns? Yeah, great question. 
So what's really interesting is dentistry has kind of always prided itself on being recession proof. And I think that that's still true. I think some things that dentists have not been good at is the market start two things that affected uh, the dental industry that they did not respond to. They thought it was DSOs and they thought it was recession. And I think it was something totally different. In 2000, this little thing called the internet comes out, 1995. And in 2007, you have an iPhone and you start moving towards social media. And what that did is it weaponized our wants. It weaponized them with new marketing capability to be able to say, you don't need to worry about going to the dentist. You need to finish this candy crush game. That's what you need to do, right? And dentists were flat footed and didn't know how to respond to that. They didn't have the marketing to overcome that. And they saw a decrease in patient flow as we got very distracted in not taking care of our oral health. I think we're much better at that now. So that's good. We're starting to fight back. The Again, if half of the marketplace isn't even coming to you, you don't have a problem with competitors other than other industries who've got them distracted saying that this is more important. Number two, I think we've gotten really bad um, at providing good financing solutions. This iPhone that I have does not cost me $1,200. It costs me $39 a month, right? But dentists have been slow to move to that economic reality that people live month to month. Now, there is a ton a ton in the last couple of years of creative solutions beyond care credit that is providing financing solutions to your patients. And I would say, you better have it. <laughs> you better be, because patients are not, they just burn through all their savings. $4 trillion was in savings after COVID because we all got a bunch of money. 1.2 trillion was in savings at the beginning of this year. We're pretty good spenders. 600 billion in savings last month. So we don't have savings. Credit card is skyrocketing like crazy. So you better have financing solutions. Now, having said that, if I think if you have good marketing, you got good financing solutions, I don't think you need to worry about a recession. I think what we are worried about, we were not prepared for is inflation. The inflationary impact is crushing us right now. I, I know they wanna say that inflation's like 8%, no way. It's not 8%. If someone moved from $10 an hour to $13 an hour, that's 30%. You know, so whatever your math is, it has crushed the margins. And you know, my son who works at Home Depot, like every two months, the whole company get, has gotten a dollar raise this year. Um, he does not deserve it, by the way, but he continues to get them. Um, and they just move up the wood price and they just move up the price for screws and you know, lights and everything else. They screw us, so to speak. They screw us. Yeah, exactly. They, um, we can't do that. You know, if we're taking PPO, uh, Medicaid, insurance, and so forth, we're up against a ceiling, but our labor costs are moving up, our supply costs, our ability to build. That's what we, I don't have a great answer for that other than what just passed in Massachusetts, uh, which on ballot number two, uh, insurance companies now have to pay 83% of revenue uh, out to providers. And we've yeah. just- we were fighting so much internally as an industry. And this is what I'm so proud about with ADSO and ADA is <laughs> awesome. Um, is that we um, were now focused on, okay, wait, we've got to get aligned with the payers because they've just been taking advantage. Like, how do you cut rates during COVID? How do you not pay dentists for PPE? I mean, that just, that feels evil. I, I need to put that on my evil slide, right? So we've got to work with payers to say, hey, listen, you know, like we're doctors, right? And like, we're trying to take care of patients here and you're still collecting premium even when they weren't going to the, like that's got to get solved and we've got to move revenue up. I'm, I'm much more nervous about that. And that's what I'm focused on with ADA and ADSO and it's going awesome as seen in Massachusetts, so. I mean, the, the cynic Emmett would say that a lot of DSOs have been financed with, with low interest rate money. Yeah. And, you know, part of what contributed to the big expansion was that money for the past 15 years has been almost free to borrow. And clearly that's changing. So I, I, I wonder how increased financing cost is going gonna, is gonna to affect DSOs. It could, um, it could bankrupt some. It could, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's yeah. probably true. I mean, you just saw Amazon's laying off 10,000 people. 
you know, we could get into macroeconomics, but the government really screws entrepreneurs, frankly, when they put in, you know, we were at $4 trillion in debt. They put in $10 trillion. Entrepreneurs, and, and you do it through low financing and other ways, entrepreneurs ride those waves. I don't think entrepreneurs are idiots, but when the government turns around and then turns that all off, it does screw with what's going on. And so I don't think, you know, Amazon and Facebook and Google all became idiots overnight, but they're having to adjust. And some of them will just simply go bankrupt. And that might happen to DSOs too. They'll get reformatted. Patients will still get taken care of and they'll get restructured and it'll move on. But yeah, that's probably on a different philosophy of boom and bust cycles of how the Fed, you know, handles things. I think most DSOs, um, are, are going to be fine. You know, they, they weren't overly leveraged, but that could be an issue. And, and that could be an issue for just your individual dentist too. Uh, it's going to be an issue for all of us, you know, frankly, is I, I would keep your debt low. I would not be heavily expanding right now. I would let things settle. It's hard to expand right now anyway, because dentists have not paid student loan debts uh, for three years, right? We don't think about that, but Dentists who've out, been out of school for a long time haven't actually ever paid a student loan debt, you know, for the last few years. So that's going to start in January. It'll be interesting to see if that increases uh, dentist desire to work more. Because one of the things we've seen is den the dentist workforce has is really lowered in some of their productivity. And I'm just speaking globally, not anybody individually. We're also going to have to figure out. We now have 60% of women graduating as dentists. Like this has been a huge shift. Women have a lot of other responsibilities. And we know through data that uh, women are about 80% productive in dentistry. What I mean by that is because of these other responsibilities, they're not 100% in uh, on a global basis. And so we're going to have to figure that out with shift work and everything else to take care of patients. It's going to get complex. Yeah. Oh, well, that kind of helps lead into the question I have from um, one of our audience members. So the question is, help me understand the DSO Aspen. They're on the trading stock market. And it seems like there's pressure of working in such a DSO as like stockholders and they provide returns on investment. Um, and they provide wonderful incentives for the owner and associates who perform a certain um, expectation. Uh, does this not change the philosophy of office or patient-centered care to revenue? So with everything you were just talking about, where things might get difficult, is that get, are we going to see that change to different DSO models like that structure? Great. Um, so Aspen isn't public. There is a Canadian group that is public, uh, but the majority... American DSOs, um, I don't think we have any major ones that are public, not that they won't be. I, I think the question is still valid. You know, okay. it's really interesting because the dentist is the customer. So they're, they're not wrong in the fact that shareholders always want to have as most profit as possible. But having said that, I can't grab David by the collar and drag him into Home Depot and say, listen, I need profit, <laughs> you know, uh, buy wood now, you know? <laughs> and I can't do that to dentists either. And if I do, I will change the culture so much, I'll lose all my dentists. So one of the things I know those major uh, DSOs do who have large investments is they make sure that everybody knows the only reason we've gotten to this point is because dentists feel safe to work here and they have autonomy to do the work that they want to do. And um, investors have to be comfortable with that. You know, but yeah. you're not, this isn't a sales force. You know, if if I'm Tesla or whatever, I can go out to my sales force and say, we got to get deliveries at this much and you got to work this much and we got to get this done. And you know, people can opt in or out of that too. But with um, clinicians, you can't do that. They'll just quit. I'll be honest, we have so much data, even with our own dentists, when they pay off their student loans, their care per visit drops by 10%. I can tell. And so, you know, we can all ask if that's ethical or not, but I just, I just know the data is whatever was a filling yesterday is not a filling after I pay off my student loans. You know, it's like, ah, eh, we'll wait and see on that one. So dentists have the flexibility. My point in this dentists have flexibility to move care where they feel it's appropriate on that day. No one is going to control them to do that. You can influence, 
by providing them better support, better technology, you know, incentive, but you're not going to make Dennis do anything. Perfect. And kind of an add-on comment to that by the same person was this, um, add to that is the manager and, oh, sorry. Add to that is that the manager and no longer the dentist sits with the patient to convince them for more costly treatment, often creating the perception of just, I guess, just selling dentistry. And yeah, so, yeah. so focus so this is, is on, no longer on healthcare, it's on selling dentistry. All right, I'm going to play this out because I kind of understand. Let's say that you say, hey, dentist, do you like selling care? And they say, no, I really don't like selling care. I like doing dentistry. Okay, we're going to get a treatment coordinator in place and they're going to sell the care for you. And dentists are like, I really like that. Now, we're going to imagine that that treatment coordinator gets some kind of bonus for selling care because the dentist wants them to sell the care, right? So they're like, hey, could we bonus them on selling care? And that treatment coordinator goes crazy. All right. And they decide they're going to sell all the care and they're going to sell more care than the patient even needs. And then the dentist says, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it doesn't really play out the way that people think. And, and I can tell you this from experience yeah. that, frankly, sometimes dentists diagnose things and a good treatment coordinator will sell it. And then the dentist will say, well, I actually don't feel comfortable doing that procedure. And guess what happens next? The patient doesn't get the procedure. And the treatment coordinator stops trying to sell things that the dentist won't do. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a, there's a weird assumption, and I'm not quite sure where this comes from in the industry, that dentists somehow can get controlled. And I've just never met a dentist that I can come behind him, grab his hands or her hands, and start doing procedures. Um, yeah. And dentists are, you know, pretty confident, strong, smart people who care about their patients. And when they don't feel comfortable doing something, they don't do it. You know, along those same lines as well, it, it, you know, I'm, I do orthodontics. So, you know, the orthodontic model for a new patient appointment, which is where you're selling the treatment, you're doing the diagnosis and selling the treatment is that if you have a 30 to 45 minute new patient appointment for an orthodontic patient, the doctor spends seven minutes or less with the patient, just going over diagnosis and doing an overview of the treatment. It's the treatment coordinator that actually sits with the patient and does the details of the treatment, sets it up, presents the fee, makes the payment plans. And I did that for several years when I first got into orthodontics. And I know it's true because I've seen it firsthand. Patients are more comfortable with that. They're more comfortable yeah. sitting down with someone that they perceive to be e equal stature with them yeah. than to sit down with someone like a dentist and then they close their lips and they don't talk anymore after that. And then they leave with questions answered. So, you know. Well, Wendy, you're exactly right. And let's take it even further. Who developed a lot of those models? It wasn't DSOs. It was actually other dentists who said, you know what I'm noticing? I'm not selling as many cases as Wendy's selling. And frankly, I don't actually like talking to these patients as much as Wendy does. And she's a lot better with them. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to start developing this model. And guess what? Their practice took off. And then guess what they started doing? They went on the road and started sh sharing with everybody else <laughs> how to optimize their practice and be better and et cetera. So a lot of these you know, models that we have that we use around treatment coordination were developed by brilliant dentists who did find out that when you're standing in a coat and you ask the mom, so do you brush your kid's teeth? That somehow that really offends them, <laughs> right? And it's better right. off to have one of your team members say, hey, I wanna show you something you know, a lot of moms don't know this, but here's a good way to brush their teeth. You probably already know this, but let me show you with, with doc out of the room, right? So things like that dentists developed over time. This was not to control dentists. It was actually no. to support them and dentists change that if they have a different personality or so forth all the time. So. Yeah. And can I add to that? In my experience, I've never been able to work with a dentist who I said, you're going to do a crown on this tooth. And ethically, I mean, 
you know, dentist, how you're trained and stuff, there's, there's a big compass there. I mean, you're not just going to dive in and do treatment on a tooth if you don't think it's necessary. You know, even if I just went up and down how I thought they should do that. I mean, that's never have I seen that happen. I'll tell you a bigger problem I see is clinicians not getting the support that they need as an associate to do the full amount of care that they need. Mm -hmm. I, I see that as a much bigger problem. Mm -hmm. I see dentists not getting the training out of dental schools that they're paying a half a million dollars for so that they can come out prepared to take care of patients. Like we have a lot more on an AI, by the way, we've got cool AI soft, software coming out around x-rays and insurance companies were thrilled. Oh my gosh, we're going to catch all these dentists for all their over-treatment. Guess mm -hmm. what? Insurance companies are not as excited about AI because guess what it's yeah. finding out? We're under treating patients. <laughs> That's the problem. The, cl the clinicians don't have all the capability they need in order to provide comprehensive care. Yeah. So this big fear that dentists were gonna over treat just isn't happening. Uh, I'm not saying there's not some bad dentists out there. There, there yeah. is, but I'm saying as a whole, uh, we need to get better at care. We need to get better at financing solutions. We need to get better at marketing. Uh, and you know that will raise the industry up. So. Yep, perfect. All right, folks. Well, we're getting um, to the witching hour here. Um, th this hat is uh, one of my new prized possessions. It's that uh, I, I happened to be speaking in Massachusetts last week after question two um, became became law in Massachusetts, and and the, um, the the place I was speaking gave me one of those hats and said it's going to be a collector's item. So I. I, I, I will hang on to it. it. It'll sit in a place of honor. It uh, passed with 73% vote. So yeah. yeah. And and like for, 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 for those of you who have been living under a rock for the past uh, month or so, uh, question two in Massachusetts forces insurers to pay out 83% of what they take in in premiums. And um, I don't think we've seen it yet, but this is going to cause an earthquake in dentistry. Uh, so uh, that's that's what Emmett was referring to and prompted me to grab my uh, vote yes on two hat. Um, so it's it's going to be a big deal. But Emmett, I want to thank you very much. Um, you 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 gave uh, exactly what I was hoping for tonight. We we got to see um, the other side of DSOs that I think a lot of dentists who aren't affiliated don't hear. Um, and and I really appreciate you coming on. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, Wendy. you bet. I, I love it. And I hope what you feel from me is I have a lot of faith in this industry. I have a lot of faith in dentists. I think that they are brilliant. And I think the impact they're having is absolutely incredible. And if we can all get behind them and support them the way you all are so that they can do what they're best at, it'll be great for the industry and it'll be great for patients. Absolutely. I mean, you don't, you don't do what we do without having a love for dentists. Um, you know, I, I sense that I meant about you from the first time I met you. You know, I think our our our, our values are are quite aligned there. So I'd like to thank Emmett. I'd like to thank my my on camera colleagues Wendy and Amber and uh, Sheila O'Driscoll who who uh, works off camera with us and and sets a lot of this stuff up. I'd like to thank them all, and of course, I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you next on January twenty sixth. It's, it's going to be a great one. I can't wait for Dr. David Hughes to tell his story. Um, and we will see you all then. Have a great night. Bye. This concludes this episode of the Prosperident webinar series. The team will be back soon with more tools and ideas. If you have questions about this webinar, if you would like to discuss your practice with one of us, or if there is a topic you would like to see in a future webinar, we would love to hear from you. You can contact Prosperident through its website, www.prosperident.com, or by calling 888-398-2327.